Welcome back to SuperCloud 4, everybody, where we're digging into the power of generative AI and how it's affecting industry transformation. And one of the industries that is most ripe for disruption is healthcare. Look, healthcare costs are rising, people are living longer, clinician burnout is an ongoing concern. The quality of healthcare globally, it spans a wide spectrum. So AI, automation, Gen AI in particular can help combat some of these challenges, but also it brings some concerns and some risks. So joining us now is Jose Pedro Almeida, who's the chief AI strategist and an expert in the healthcare industry. Jose, thank you so much for coming on the program. It's great to see you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Okay, big chewy question to get started. How would you describe the state of healthcare from a global perspective today? Well, I think there's, uh, we are fa facing a major issue, which is uh, the workforce problem. Um, we, are, we are seeing that after the pandemic, uh, workforce has just dropped like by 30, 20, 30%. And that uh, means a huge pressure to the system, uh, to those that are in the field trying to treat patients because uh, patients keep going up, physicians and nurses keep going down, and you need to introduce some uh, intelligence to the system in order to overcome these issues. So AI obviously can have some real positive effects. We, we, we are enthused by that. Better personalization, things like faster drug discovery. I mean, automation can help reduce cost. There's augmented diagnoses that are happening today. You things like proactive disease prediction, but as well, there's some concerns related to privacy leakage, a, a misdiagnosis, maybe over-reliance on machines. So it's a two-sided coin. How should we think about AI and, and healthcare in the most logical way to implement it? Well, first of all, I think that, um, you know, the role of some companies that have been selling this hype of AI has brought some mistrust um, into the system, which does not help. Uh, I think first you need, you know, to go into the field, understand doctors and nurses' most fundamental issues, partner with them, uh, change your language, you know, start stopping uh, talking about Python and cloud computing and all of that and start talking about, you know, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus bacteria and how do they treat them, go into their field, understand their problems and then build the things with them. Uh, and that has a lot of layers, especially in, in, in large healthcare organizations where you first need to capture all the data that is siloed in several uh, information systems, you need to unlock that data, bring it into you know, a centralized data platform, and then you start building the intelligence on top of that. But all that intelligence is built side by side with clinicians. It's not, it, it, it does not work going outside in with some solution and trying to plug. It doesn't work that way. You need to build it from the inside, build it with them. And I think that when you do that, the level of trust that you are able to achieve from them is usually higher because they know, you know, the operating boundaries of what you are doing. They will be the first ones uh, advising you, you know, let's do this, you know, in more back office areas, uh, do no harm to patients. Don't try to uh, do the AI that will diagnose patients. That's super naive to think about at this time. Uh, you need to respect a lot uh, uh, the way doctors resonate, it's hugely complex. We know these new new models are bringing new technology into the scene, but even so, uh, the, the, there's, there's some part of magical reasoning into how, how a doctor thinks uh, that we need to respect uh, and we need to build things that help them and, and that are a co-pilot to him and not trying to replace the way he diagnoses because I, I think that won't happen soon. You know, there's an analog in, in IT for years. We talk about, you can't, you can't talk geek. You got to talk wallet when you're talking to the business. You, you can't talk Kubernetes. You have to talk about patient care and patient outcomes with the doctors and nurses. So you sort of touched on this, but how are organizations integrating generative AI within current medical practices and models? And where are you seeing the immediate and most beneficial impact on patient care? Well, for the first questions, where, where are organizations doing this? I don't see any, any examples worldwide, maybe a few of them in the US, like you know, HCA Healthcare is, is doing some partnerships uh, with Google, for instance, uh, trying to you know, automate 
the nurse shifting um, moment and trying to build Gen AI, to bring Gen AI into the, into the game where Gen AI can summarize uh, what happened in the last 12 hours uh, of care and send that information to the nursing team that is uh, arriving into the hospital in, in, in order for them to be uh, more proactively informed uh, before that nursing shift and handoff meeting occurs. Uh, and you see those, those examples, but you know it's still starting. Uh, I think that uh, at the board level, um, people are starting to worry about this and wanting to have this, but there's a, a, also uh, some road uh, to go ahead in terms of um, the skills that you need to bring into the C-suite uh, as well, because it's not, this is not a management game. This, this is transforming the healthcare organization into uh, some, somehow a technology company. And that's, you need special skills as well in, in the leadership team to bring that into, into the game. But in terms of uh, the second question, how do I see the impact of, of this? Uh, I think the impact will be just uh, huge. Uh, we, we are facing an inflection moment in time uh, from my standpoint. Uh, and I think healthcare is probably the area that will benefit the most from this if you are able to plug it in to the operating system. Uh, because uh, if, you, if you look around, uh, healthcare data represents, I don't know, maybe 30% of healthcare data globally, according to some studies. Uh, but uh, the, there's a recent study that just came out signaling that 97% of, for instance, hospital data that is being produced is not used. And one of the reasons um, for that is that more than 80% of that data is in an unstructured form. So think about those clinical notes um, that are sitting in the database that are locked over there. They just they, they are just being used for you know transactional care between the doctor and one patient, but you are not leveraging all the insights that are already there, and that you, you could just um, put an LLM on top of this. And understanding patterns, you know, there's so many things that we could do uh, with this. Uh, like, um, I can give you just an example, which I think uh, uh, really resonates in terms of patient safety. Just imagine that in the future, and when I say the future, I'm, I'm probably talking about the next two or three years, you can have a large language model that has ingested all those clinical notes inside the hospitals, thousands and thousands of them. And you can throw a question like being, imagine you are a clinical director of the hospital. You can throw a question in a, in a flash of a second, which is a, a broad question thrown out in a natural language way, like tell me who are the doctors who are not following clinical guidelines in my hospital? Like analyze a thousand beds, a thousand clinical pro processes in a flash of a second and tell me, for instance, uh, patients that are taking antibiotics for uh, patients that are with fever for more than three days and are, are not taking antibiotics. Uh, probably they should, probably there's a clinical guideline for that. And if you, are, if you are, have a system that is able to do this at scale, the level of safety and efficiency you can bring into a, an organization is just unprecedented. And, and Jose, is, are the so-called guardrails inherently in place because you know, unlike ChatGPT, which is scouring the internet and Wikipedia and everything else, you're working on a corpus of data that is that is fixed, that's restricted, that's 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 specific to a particular organization. So is it a is it a self uh, uh, adjudicating mechanism in that sense, or are there other concerns about hallucinations and things like that? Well. Uh, one of the things we need to take into account from the very start is that uh, these, these language models that are available nowadays, they learn from the public internet. Uh, they have not seen uh, most of the clinical data. And that's a problem, you know, we, and we can talk about uh, the existence of a public, inter a public internet and a private internet. Uh, and when you talk about hospital data, you are talking about a private inter internet that, has, that is highly secured behind firewalls and all that. And so these models have not seen that data. And doctors uh, and nurses, they write you know, in, a, in a certain way that you don't see spread, spread out in the web. Like they do a lot of acro acronyms and all, and all of that. And so what I think is that um, you are also seeing that trend, like these, these language models uh, are starting to be available uh, with lo uh, a lot less um, parameters, 
where you can just train a model like this almost in your computer. And I think you will see these organizations building their own modules um, and, they, and, and taking advantage of that, fine tuning uh, uh, with their clinicians, doing that also that reinforcement learning that you need to do on top with your clinicians uh, to, to fine tune the system for your reality. But when you are able to do that, and, 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 and that part I think will be pretty fast with, with the pace that you are seeing this evolving, when you do that, you know, you will have um, something, an entity, uh, an intelligence layer in your organization uh, that is able to, to help any physician perform at the top of their license. Uh, and that's uh, hugely valuable. And, and I would think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, independent of LLMs and, and GPT threes and fours, that, that things like readmission rates, you organizations have data on that. They can apply machine intelligence and, and, and predictive analytics and have probably been doing that for quite some time. And, and I, I presume that's, that's best practice in certain hospitals anyway, is that, is that fair? I honestly don't think that's fair. Uh, uh -oh. I think there are some hospitals that are more advanced yeah. uh, and where you, where you have that, uh, those insights running. Uh, but what I, what I know from most hospitals globally, you know, they are, they are still lagging behind. Um, there are some indicators that they follow. Some, they, they, they might, might have a few bunch of models that they run, um, but, but I think the game here is different. You need to have, uh, you know, a, a new strategy for data and for AI uh, that starts, uh, you know, pulling up that, that, that data from those silos, bringing that data intelligence layer uh, ready, and then you just plug these models uh, on top of it. Uh, and you are able to achieve much more when you do that. I've done that throughout my career, um, what I led uh, 10 years ago, and almost also for, for 10 years, one of the, the most recognized uh, big data and AI projects globally in a public hospital in Portugal, but where we invested upfront for several years, building that layer, and then started building the intelligence on top. And where, what we were able to achieve with that was, for instance, having agents that would crawl all that data in an automated way and would figure out, for instance, that some patient in the ninth floor of the hospital was with his heart rate going up and blood pressure going down, which is a sign of hemodynamic instability of the body. And those same agents would crawl all those other systems, finding out in an automated way, for instance, that that same patient at that same time had a life-threatening potassium level. And so when you cross all these signs, you can inform, and we were sending text messages to the doctors in an automated fashion, you can inform them proactively of the problems. And so this, this vision of computational care is something that takes time. It's not just I'm building a, you know, some AI model to uh, find out my readmission rate and all of that. No, you, you need to think this for the whole organization. And now you will, you will speed up care. And now you, you will bring up problems much faster to, to clinicians, but also to nurses. Because what I learned in healthcare is that if you are able to reduce the time where the moment or the moment when the information is available in any system until the moment a clinician knows about it, if you are able to, to, to shorten this, you can bring huge uh, positive uh, outcomes to the patients. Yeah, no, that's a key, key um, um, uh, optimization metric. I'm sort of half kidding, but you know, um, doctors uh, writing make my handwriting look great, uh, actually. But can, can AI read doctor scribbles? I'm, I'm sort of half kidding. I'm sure a lot of it's now, now done with keyboards. <laughs> but I wanted, I wanted to come back to a comment that you made earlier that we shouldn't think about machines making diagnoses instead of doctors. I, I, I want to come back to that because like self-driving cars, and even if self-driving cars are more reliable than humans, which they're really not yet, uh, I think we're probably a decade away from that, but assuming they are, a misdiagnosis of errors made by the AI could be seen as more onerous than, than human error. But you were intimating before that that is not the right way to think about AI. So how should uh, the healthcare industry, you know, think about uh, that balance between human expertise and AI driven insights? Well, the first thing is don't try to diagnose. I, I, I don't think that's the right path. There are so many issues 
you know, that you can uh, improve before that happens. Uh, we are talking about almost, uh, you know, every uh, mundane task that doctors do nowadays. Uh, and I've led some projects uh, trying to automate that with, with NLP, which was uh, what existed at the time, which, uh, you know, it's the same reasoning that we have now with these language models. Um, for instance, uh, you know, think about what my team also led in the past, like uh, summarizing an inpatient episode, like 30 days, uh, um, a COPD patient, which, which is a patient which has a lot of comorbidities, stays a lot of time in a hospital, goes frequently to the hospital. Just think about all those days that is, if that patient is in the inpatient area. And at the end of that episode, the doctor needs to write a discharge note. And just think about that in the future, that you can just click a button. The LLM will summarize that episode for him in a flash of a second. And, and he will, will just, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. Let's uh, check uh, there's something that it, it didn't capture some way. But, but it's not only this. Think about that after that, the patient goes home. When the patient goes home, the LLM can send him a discharge note that's personalized to him, you know? getting all that jargon, that clinical jargon that's complex for a patient to understand, summarizing the epi what, what happens inside the hospital, but in a, a different language, and also producing another version for his referencing physician. So it, just imagine all this flow running a lot faster, a lot more automated. Obviously, doctors are in the middle. This is a co-pilot. This is not a pilot. But, doc but doctors will be much more productive. We will be able to see much more patients when they use these tools. Because I've seen, I've seen those tools working and, and I know how powerful they are. You know, you're bringing up a really great point and I'm thinking about it. We can all think about our, our personal experiences. I remember I had a blood test this summer and I got the results. It came in about like literally 30 different files that I had to open each one separately and, and look at the results, it was crazy. I said, well, if I'm in trouble, the doctor will call me. I gave it to my wife. I said, yeah, you interpret this. And she's so kind. She went through and did all the analysis and said, you know, you're, you're okay. You know, maybe check this out a little bit. But I mean, having an LLM, just feeding that data in and say, okay, hey, tell me what I, what I need to know. Uh, saves the doctor time, saves the, the patient time, and it doesn't you know, converse in, in all this gobbledygook, but, but I want to talk about data, data privacy. It's always a major concern in healthcare. How can we ensure that AI, which has this hunger for more data, doesn't compromise patient confidentiality and trust? Well, uh, that, that's a hard question. Uh, I think, I think if, you go, if you go through that uh, row that I was telling about, uh, where you try to build your own LLM, uh, you have a lot more control than if you outsource this. Uh, of, of course, I can. Im I, I know. I know that if you outsource this, you know. Um, just imagine that you have all your data in Azure. Uh, it's very easy to plug in to to open AI models, uh, and and that's quite productive. But for some sensitive use cases, uh, those gu those guardrails need to be done. You know, with an ethics commission that sits inside the hospital. Once again, these things are built as a team. They are not built outside in, uh, selling you a product and plugging um, to your system. And so if you, if you have this multidisciplinary team where you have you know, the AI slash software guys, the clinicians, the ethics committee, uh, and, you, and you try to, to bring, it, bring them all into the game, uh, it's much easier to bring uh, those guardrails into the system. There are a lot of technical things that we could discuss. Uh, you know, you could have several LLMs uh, talking to each other. It, you can have, you know, uh, an, an ethics LLM that only worries about ethics uh, of what the other LLM is doing. Um, and I think we'll see that happen. Um, but once again, uh, we need to start from scratch. And from, from scratch is the framework, uh, the people framework you have uh, to build um, these things. And I think that it should, it should be done from the inside. It has fits our model of, of sort of the long tail of, 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 of specialized LLMs and domain specific LLMs. But, but speaking of the people, I want to ask you, 
Uh, Jose, how do you see the role of medical professionals evolving in an era where AI takes on a much more significant role in, in healthcare and, and patient planning and communications? I think they will be much more happier uh, than they are today, honestly. Uh, because um, there are a lot of studies that show you that for each hour uh, of patient care that they have with the patient, they, they lose two hours uh, doing those mundane tasks like writing in the computer, uh, sometimes taking work home because uh, they want to see more patients. That's, that, that, that's something I learned working 10 years in, you know, inside the hospital um, was that uh, they have the, this mission uh, inside them. They want to treat more patients. They want to treat them effectively. And I think that if you have something uh, that treats, you know, that, that takes care of everything that is not what you study for. You, you, what they study for is to save lives at the end of the day. And if you have some, and, and along the way, you know, electronic health records came along, they helped, but they also uh, introduced a new layer that makes them lose time. If you, if you bring something into the game that saves them time, and, uh, and and you can think about. I I think that in in the near future. I don't I don't I don't know if you, it will take five to ten years, but the same way we we have seen Windows uh, and and Office and and um, the change that brought into the system, I think we will see a new operating system uh, in healthcare where doctors are with patients without any PC uh, in the room. There's something. Uh, listening to that conversation, it's going back and forth. Is going to see the anal the, the blood sampling of that patient. Is going to see uh, and bring the image of that patient. But the doctor is not going to write everything. It it, it 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 will just spend time with the patient. I think that will happen sooner or later. I don't know five ten years. Uh, it will happen for sure. Okay. Well, that brings me, Jose, to my last question, which is the big one: was what about cost? I mean, a lot of people are predicting a massive productivity boom as a result of AI, will that translate into lower healthcare costs in your opinion? For sure, for sure. <laughs> I have no doubt about it. Uh, uh, that. Ju just imagine that, um, because we, we talk a lot about these large healthcare organizations that for instance exist in the US and in Europe and all that, but what about all the, the other part of the world like, uh, Rural, rural uh, Africa, rural India, where you have farmers that are like, you know, 100 miles away from a hospital. Um, I, I know, for instance, uh, in, in, in South Africa, uh, because of, of a work I've done within SEAD uh, that, that, that I'm following with them, uh, that, that there's, there are a, a bunch of clinics, which are called Unjani clinics that are run by nurses, you know, in the middle of Africa, and they are alone those nurses, they even prescribe um, medication to patients. And so you can imagine that those um, nurses will have their personal assistant, like a specialized doctor that is sitting uh, nearby and that is helping to, to, to provide much better care. Because if you, if you look at this trend, it is highly democratized. It is very easy to make this available globally, even today, what exists today can already improve healthcare and can, can already lower costs of accessing healthcare. And at the same time, just to finish, you can also think about those, ge those general practitioners that sometimes are in front of a patient. They need to have a specialized uh, insight from a specialist in terms of the condition of that patient. And I think that sooner or later, you will see that specialist um, going through also the LLM that specialize, for instance, in uh, opth ophthalmology or, uh, you know, uh, general, general surgery or uh, any other thing. And that LLM will also help the general practitioner have some insights that by today, you would need to call a specialist if the specialist is available. In, and, and also obviously the costs go up when, uh, when you have this kind of mindset, but you cannot scale to, to every patient with every doctor. And so you need new approaches that are much more intelligent. 
Yeah, I look forward to that, that day coming sooner rather than later. Jose, thank you. Really appreciate your time. Okay. Oh, an honor. Uh, uh, thank, to be here. Thank you. It's great to have you. We'd love to have you back. It's a really interesting conversation. And thank you for watching SuperCloud 4 live and on demand from our Palo Alto studios. John Furrier, Rob Strecce, and I will be right back right after this short break.